Welcome everyone to the 2023 uh, NNLM Virtual Symposium on Health Misinformation. We are very glad that you can join us today. I'm Margie Shepard, Community Engagement Coordinator for Region 3 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Our regional medical library is located at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth, Texas. However, I'm based out of the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. We have just a few technical items to cover before we get started. All attendees have been muted, but we do welcome your questions and comments in the Zoom chat at any time. VFAIRS is providing technical assistance today, and we also have NNLM staff that will keeping an eye on the chat with me. Uh, please be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu when posting your comments in chat to ensure that everyone sees them. Please also submit questions for the speakers using the Q&A function to ensure they do not get lost in the chat. We have live closed captioners for this event. You can access the closed captions by clicking on the icon at the bottom of um, the screen and selecting closed captions. If you'd like to share on social media, we encourage you to do so using the hashtag for the event, Health Misinfo NNLM. So before um, we get started, I would like to share a little bit about who we are. The National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency, and many of you might be more familiar with the Na National Center for Allergies and Infectious Diseases, which is one of the many institutes and centers at NIH. NLM, or the National, Medi National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices at the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources like PubMed and Medline Plus. NNLM, the network of the National Library of Medicine, is an outreach program of NLM working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. It is my pleasure to introduce the first of um, the first group of speakers for today. Jerry Lynn Bomblot is the Chief Engagement Officer at Docala, a patient education platform. She collaborates on patient outcomes, research, and served as the multimedia expert on AHRQ's patient education materials assessment tool. She is joined by Iran uh, Kabakov, the founder and CEO of Dakala. Iran is a doctor of physical therapy, digital health innovator, entrepreneur, and public speaker. So I'm gonna stop sharing and let them get started. Okay, just waiting for my screen to share here. And let me hit play. And we should be on go. Okay. Can you see that? Uh yes. Okay. Can. Yeah. Can so um, yeah. So as we said, um Iran is a clinician. So, uh, excuse me, it's your speaker view, Jerry. Oh, I don't know why it's doing that. Well, let's see if we can. I think I'll have to try and reshare. Hang on. Share. Try again. Was working fine before. How's that? No, it's yep. still, it's still sleep. It's still your speaker view. Mm -hmm. You had that earlier. So let's. I'm not doing anything different. Just switch it. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, go up to. Uh huh. Now. Try on, uh, on the right hand side, Jerry. There's a sh there should be uh, the option if you when you hover over, you see those little icons. Hover over. So the arrows, the, the two arrows there on the right? No. 
you move move the mouse on the on the um uh, it's not letting me while I'm sharing. Do you um, have two screens, screen Jerry? Do you have two screens, Jerry? I do. If you um maybe select the other screen that where it's fully I have tried, uh, but... okay. Um, uh, here's what I'll do. I'll uh, share my screen and okay. um, yeah, maybe, sounds uh, good. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's suddenly acting up. No problem. Okay, so as you can see, Iran is a uh, therapist, a physical therapist, and clinician, and he's been using this approach of e-prescribing information to patients before, after, and between visits, and. I've been working to design that type of information for over 20 years. And so really, sometimes we hear this called flipping the clinic or e-prescribing or information therapy, all the same thing. It's really the idea that we are giving people the information they need to come to any kind of clinical encounter or leave a clinical encounter and understand what's going on and not feel the need to go online and look a hundred things up. Next screen. So when we think about what patients want, you know, there's often missing puzzle pieces and they're trying very hard to create a mental model and get the gist of something. They need that picture. They need complete information that really connects the dots and addresses their concerns. So for example, if we're telling somebody, oh, you need to stop smoking before spine surgery, that can cause problems with healing. That's often not enough information. They don't understand why. They don't understand that smoking affects blood flow and that bones and the spine need blood to heal. So that takes about 10 extra seconds. And that's the type of information that can be standardized and delivered so that people get those needs met. Because right now, you know how it feels if you have a puzzle and there's pieces missing, it makes you crazy. And what people will do if you don't give them all the information they need is they will look for ways to fill it. And this is often what drives people to go online. Next slide. And when we look at the research on why people search before visits, they're often trying to understand their symptoms, manage their condition. Sometimes they're trying to figure out, do I even need to see a doctor or a clinician? Uh, other times they're trying to do their homework. They're trying to really be able to describe the problem and prepare their questions because they know they're gonna have limited time and they know that unfortunately, often people are gonna be speaking to them with medical jargon, they don't understand. Uh, so they wanna be able to make good use of that time, know what the clinician's saying, and they actually want to be seen as prepared and competent, which also gives them confidence and autonomy to talk to the doctor. Next. And then when we look at the research for why people search after or between visits, it's because they now have all this new information and they need to clarify it or they want to understand more. Uh, they often walk away with new questions they didn't have before, especially on that drive home or whatever it might be. Uh, other times they're just curious and they have nagging questions when working with women who needed to have their uterus removed for a hysterectomy, uh, obviously not part of what would be called basic informed consent, but it was driving them crazy that nobody explained to them, you know, what are the, what happens to that space where my uterus was? And I've actually had women hug me <laughs> when they understood the answer to that question. Um, so again, sometimes they just have these nagging questions. Other times, there might not be a treatment, so they're investigating what they can do, or they're looking for other treatment options if the initial one doesn't sound great to them, or they're even looking for second opinions. Next. Um, and in all of these cases, they're often really very interested to know what are other people's lived experiences. What has it been like to either live through having this condition, having this procedure, going through this treatment? And online groups and information gives them kind of comfort and support while being able to maintain emotional distance, like they're not having to go show up for a support group. It also, they're looking for those insights and candor about what is it really like to go through this? How are you coping with it? And what is the reality? 
next. So when we look at online health searches, because with all of these nagging questions, that's why people go online, people don't love doing this. They say they themselves say that they aren't the best people to appraise the online information. Uh, they often feel more overwhelmed and anxious with even new questions or concerns. And this isn't a great feeling. They don't actually want to be doing this. The good news is, on the next slide, that um, when we look at trust in sources of health information, clinicians by far are still highly trusted. It's maybe been waning, but it's still quite good. And look, this is a survey that Rock Health did of over 8,000 people that people are going to websites with some concerns and trepidation. So 16% say they trust websites and 36% say they don't or they can't or they don't have the expertise to trust it. Next. And so when we think about these two pieces, what patients really want is they want appropriate, reliable health information from their clinicians. They don't want to do these searches where they're wandering around sometimes for hours, trying to figure out what is the right information and whether it applies to them. Um, and they want good quality information that gives them the confidence to go back in and have a good conversation with their clinician. Next. And so really e-prescribing information and meeting people's informational needs is a great way not to just capitalize on the trust that we do have, but it's also a way to build trust. Um, what people are looking for, and we know that two of the main components of trust are warmth and competence. So people want a good relationships. They want to know, do you have my best interests at heart and do I matter to you? And then they want to know, are you competent? Do you have good expertise? Do you know what you're doing? And these come together. And so I've actually seen when people get this kind of information from their doctor in focus groups I've conducted and things like that that people say they just can't even imagine that a clinician would care about them so much as to proactively give them all this information in a way they can understand it that answers all of their questions. So it's incredibly compelling to them and people really feel cared for. Next. Uh, and when we look at this uh, trust and health information, um, part of the problem happens is if we're not proactively meeting those info information needs, again, they need to fill it. They need it to make sense. And so there's often then, unfortunately, this tension where people might even come in with printouts or the information the clinician is giving them didn't match a web search. Now, instead, the clinician's like on their back foot. And instead of spending the time collaborating they might be pushing back on things or having to spend a lot of time debunking information and kind of pulling somebody back to, well, or this is, information isn't right for you. So initially what some studies have found is that people wanna see that technical competence and knowledge, do you know what you're doing? But then once they get to know a clinician and they feel that they're competent, the focus really shifts to, do you value me as a person? And the way they judge that is often, are you listening to me? Are you providing person-centered care? And are you giving me information that's easy to understand and to act on? Next. So this is the approach that um, I've seen work now for over 20 years across literally hundreds of thousands of people, and yet, uh, I think there's so much more that could be done with it. Instead of letting people wander around the internet, finding what they might, we can actually curate information, either resources that we have and have created within the hospital. Uh, Iran will tell you how he even makes his own little videos for patients very quickly, or even sending them to the right place on a website or a video. Uh, because even if you tell somebody with breast cancer, for example, oh, here's a good website, they might go there, but they still might look at the information that's not right for their type of cancer. So again, really making sure we're doing this kind of warm handoff and giving people what they need. Um, and so this shows how we can really curate that 
and create really like a course or a module, send it to patients and actually know if they view it. But Iran, I've seen this a lot and heard a lot from the clinicians that I've worked with over the years that, you know, people really find that instead of somebody coming in with printouts or concerns from something they read online, that when they're proactively given this information, the clinicians and the patients just have a much better experience and conversation. So maybe you can start by telling us what your experience has been like. Sure. Well, as a, as a physical therapist, I think a big part of my practice is ed educating patients. I see them for a very short amount of time. Um, and for them to succeed out in the wild, they need to know what they're doing. So usually I give the example of, of low back pain as, as a classic patient. When somebody walks through the door to see me and they have back pain, they've already read about it. They talk to the neighbor and their coworker. They've uh, already looked at 10 different products and videos that are going to eliminate the back pain right now, right away. Um, and, and a lot of my time is spent on, on dispelling these myths uh, in the clinic. And that's why I, you know, I got involved with technology early in my career, because I wanted to find a way to, um, to share information better with patients. And I'm glad to say that there are many different avenues and products to do it today. Um, and, and really, it, it, it comes down when we talk about trust and, and relationships with patient, to me, it comes down to a, a basic fact. For me, the information I'm sharing with patient patients is basic and repetitive. But for the patient, it's the first time they've heard it. It's, the, it's, it's literally like they just heard it. Um, and and that, that chasm between me and the patient can very easily, if I'm, if I'm tired, if I'm overworked, become really big issue because, you know, the patient might feel that I'm dismissing them or not giving them the, the right uh, means to, to get better. So uh, I think with technology, and I'm going to, you know, uh, let's look at the next slide here. Um, what we have is we have the ability nowadays to, to collect information from the web, create information in our office, uh, go to uh, uh, libraries of information that are, that are uh, curated by organizations like universities and, and hospitals and others, and combine them into a module or course and, and e-prescribe it to the patient either before, which is what I prefer to do, prime the patient for the appointment, or uh, provide them information for between the visits so that they can actually have uh, the information they need. And so example of what it might look like is something like this. So this is a page where I, as a clinician, I come here and I upload materials. Uh, I give a quick overview and, and, I, and I add it to my library. Uh, I personally, like you said, I, I create a lot of videos with my webcam, just sitting in front of Zoom and recording the video or using my, my cell phone and, and recording a quick message for the patient. I have the luxury in my practice to, to be able to do that. Uh, I can create a quiz or a survey to, to get information from the patient or help them understand what it is that they viewed. Uh, and then once that information is, is, uh, is collected, I can then put it in a sequence. So, you know, here, the, this is a demo. So what you see on the screen is, is um, you know, me giving a quick uh, 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 introduction to the patient. And while it says COVID uh, and hand washing, let's think about back pain. It might be anatomy of the disc and uh, exercises you should do at home with a quick quiz on what are the, you know, what are the, the tips for doing the exercises correctly. Uh, and then once I have that done and I prescribed it to the patient, uh, I can actually see what the patient is doing with the information. Now, you know, Again, I'm 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 working in a small private practice environment, so I'm I'm the one who's managing this, and I can see that Beth watched um, the the first course completely, and the second one she she hasn't. So I'm able to sit down and cover the rest of the materials, but I can also uh, remind her and tell her, hey, you know, view the information, or um, you know, why don't you, you know, like when she comes in, I can say, you know, you didn't complete the course. What was the problem? Uh, and sometimes I find out that the information is too uh, over over her head or it, it is scary or it's just not, not you know, maybe she just had technical problems. 
Um, but it enables me to do that. And with big, big organizations, we see that the patient navigators and the support team might be the ones doing that. Uh, and this is what Beth might see. So she would see this, you know, she logs in, she sees the course, uh, she hits the start and button and, and she views the information. So for, for the patient, it is really a, a, a seamless experience. And so being able to provide information that way um, really makes it easy for me to, to prime the patient and, and uh, support them when they're not with me in the office. And I'm going to push, I'm going to give it back to you, Jerry. Right. And I think what's really interesting is when people are getting this kind of prescribed information, they're not just searching less usually, but they're, they really do have improved understanding and retention. They can watch these things at home. They can also share it with family members, uh, which can also be people who are doing web searches, trying to figure out how do I help my my family member or friend. Uh, we do see that there's evidence that it lowers people's anxiety and uh, creates those better visits, better conversations, improved adherence and outcomes. And I think it's really telling that some of these studies uh, find that about 93% of people are satisfied when it's good prescribed information that meets their needs. So again, there's just not those drivers. It's really preventing people from the desire to go online where they're gonna potentially run across misinformation. Next. Uh, and I think what we really wanna emphasize here is that quality matters, that we need to be giving people really good information that's been designed with patients. So it needs to be easy to understand and act on, it needs to be designed and tested with patients to make sure it is answering their questions and, and not creating lots of new ones. Uh, and then people do wanna know that other people like them informed the content. It's called social proofing and it gives them confidence that you're incorporating that information about that lived experience. And that's really important to include as well because people want that candor. Um, and is it answering, again, those questions and concerns? So I think that's about it for us. If you go to the last slide, we this is being done at a lot of different um, places, but I think we could see much, much more of it. We could see better use of this. We could see a lot of quick ways, I think, to pre create content. I think, Iran, what's interesting about what you do is you often might have a course that you're giving to somebody say about low back pain, but then you'll just quickly create a 90 second video just to kind of have that warm introduction for them. Um, and do you find that that has a big impact as well? Yeah, well, I want to build a relationship with the patient and, and I, if I can do that uh, before they come to the office, then all the better or after, you know, maintain the relationship afterwards. I do see a question in the in the question and answer that Liz asked about, you know, using uh, libraries from hospitals and information that is created. I think that absolutely, I love to do that. All right, I I don't want to reinvent the wheel, so I'll find that and and I will uh, bookend it with my intro and outro um, to to just give more of a personal relationship building experience for the patient. So, and these are our references, and I think we're holding for now for questions for later, correct, Margie? Correct, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. So if you'll stop sharing, I'll... Okay, great, thank you so much. So let me uh, introduce our next group. All right, so... Um, so it is my uh, pleasure to introduce the next group of speakers that we have. Kelsey Coles is a research and instruction librarian at the University of Pittsburgh Health Sciences Library System. Her colleague, Rebecca Miller, also joins us today. She is a librarian from the same institution, and she is the library's liaison, liaison to the School of Nursing. They're also joined by a third colleague, Rachel Suffolk a librarian from the same um, university library, and she is the liaison to the School of Dental Medicine. 
So I'm going to go ahead and pass this to them and I will let you share your slides. All right. Thank you, Margie. Mm -hmm. Just get my slides shared here. All right. Does that look correct? Perfect. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Kelsey Coles. Uh, like Margie said, thank you for the intro. I'm here today with my colleagues, Rachel Suppock and Rebecca Miller. Um, we're all librarians at the Pitt Health Sciences Library System. And we co-teach a lot of classes and sessions on the topic of health misinformation um, for audiences ranging from health sciences grad students and faculty to public library patrons to even high schoolers. Um, so today we're going to be sharing with you a quick overview of a topic that we think deserves some attention that it's largely not been getting in the discussions of health misinformation, and that's the topic of visual health misinformation. So we're going to cover the potential impacts of misleading visual communications, examples, and how to recognize several different types of visual misinformation. And we'll give you some tips for how to bring this topic into your library or organization's programming. So first off, why is visual misinformation distinct and important? To summarize some main points in the literature on this topic, we know that people tend to be more likely to believe a statement if it's accompanied by an image. So one study found that people were more likely to find a statement about something believable if it was accompanied by a picture of that thing. For instance, the statement turtles are deaf is more believable if accompanied by a picture of a turtle. So I've added a picture of a cute turtle to this slide to enhance my credibility. Um, we also know that people are more likely to remember images than they are to remember words. And we also know that including a photo in a social media post on most platforms increases the likelihood that that post will be liked or shared or commented on, um, which of course is how things on social media platforms go viral. So they are then seen by more people who are then more likely to believe and remember them. You get the picture. Unfortunately, misleading visualizations do not just come from questionable sources. Uh, we have some examples in here from public health departments and other reliable sources of information. Of course, this is usually not done intentionally, but I think it's important for everyone to be able to recognize when how the data is presented doesn't quite align with what it actually says. So some things that you can be alert for when it comes to data visualizations. Um, the first thing is access manipulation. This often takes the form of truncating or omitting the zero point or baseline. Of course, this can be useful if you're looking at values that are really similar to each other. So you can sort of see the difference a little bit better, but it can also be misleading for the same reason. Also be on the lookout for inverted axes or axes that start at a high value and decrease to zero, um, charts that have two or more different vertical axes for different categories of data, charts where the scale is not consistent all the way across the axis, and charts where there is no scale. And we'll see some examples of some of these. Um, you can also look out for data that is presented visually but it's just kind of in an unhelpful or confusing way. Um, be especially aware of poor bin selection or too many or too few bins, the wrong bins, so that you can't really accurately um, interpret the data. So on this slide is an example of how using specific bins versus a continuous color scale. So the top is specific bins, the bottom is a continuous color scale, um, how they can paint two kind of different pictures of the exact same data. Of course, color choices can also be misleading or confusing, especially if someone's using two similar colors or counterintuitive colors. And of course, that's also an accessibility issue. Finally, beware of visualizations that omit context or certain parts of the data to give a particular impression. So the first chart on this slide shows the homicide rate from 2010 to 2020, and the second shows the rate from 1985 to 2020. So both of these presentations are based on the same data, it's real data, but they do give very different impressions. Also look out for visuals that are presented without necessary context, um, that are presenting total numbers instead of numbers per capita, or that are implying a correlation between two things that are clearly not connected. All right, so I'm going to breeze through a few examples here. Um, on this uh, graph, what we see is um, the creator of this graph has inverted the y-axis. So if you look at the top, it starts at zero, and then the, the 
um, bottom is actually the higher numbers. Um, and then they've used color in a way that emphasizes the top of the chart. So what this ends up looking like is it looks like in 2005 when Florida passed a standard ground law that gun deaths in Florida suddenly decreased dramatically. Um, but because the inverted axis, actually the opposite is true. Um, and we don't know if this is causal, but um, it's certainly implying something that is not the case. Um, on this one, we have a change of scale. So if you look at both actually the x-axis and the y-axis on this one, the distance between the data points is not the same. Um, and what the effect of this is on this one is it makes this increase in COVID cases in the US um, look a little bit more gradual than it actually is. All right, this one comes to us from the Georgia Department of Health. Um, we have two maps here of Georgia showing the cases per 100,000 of uh, COVID um, between July 2nd and July 17th. And at first glance, the maps look pretty similar. The map on the right actually maybe even looks a little bit um, less, like uh, lighter colors. Um, but actually, if you look closely, what they've done is they've changed the numbers that go into each bin. So they have sort of obscured an increase in the number of cases by changing the bins on the maps. And then finally, on this example, um, I like this one to illustrate the difference between showing um, raw numbers and showing rates or per capita. Um, so if you look at California on this map, on the one on the left, California is a dark blue. It's in the highest category for a number of new cancers. In the map on the right, um, California is white, which is the lowest category, and that's the rate of new cancers. So if you look at these, you get very different impressions about um, what's going on in California with cancer. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Rachel. Hi, so I'm going to be talking about photos taken out of context. Um, I say specifically photos, but really any imagery also applies for videos. Um, and on the right-hand side of this title slide, we just have an example of a tweet um, that's claiming to show the damage that the Biden administration has done to the country, but none of the images are actually from the United States during the time of his presidency. Next slide. So um, when I talk about photos out of context, we're talking about images that are real, they aren't AI generated, they aren't necessarily altered, but they are taken um, into a different context. So this example here is a photograph, an aerial photograph of a big crowd. And the original caption says Berlin right now protesting the COVID hoax. However, this has been um, miscaptioned because it's really in Switzerland and it's a parade slash music festival that took place on August 10th of 2019. So um, that's well before the pandemic even started. One way to look for images that have been taken out of context or to see if an image has been taken out of context is to use a reverse image search. Um, so if you use Chrome as your browser, you can just right click on an image and then choose search image with Google and it will show you any previous examples of that picture or other examples of that picture online. Um, so in this case, um, this original post says that it is an image early in the COVID pandemic of people lying dead in the streets of China. However, if you do the reverse image search, you'll see that that picture is actually from Germany in 2014. And it was some sort of like art installation um, situation. So those people are very much alive. And it is once again, well before COVID started. Um, your other option for reverse image search, and this works in other browsers, not just Chrome, is to actually go to Google Images and click on the little camera icon and then upload an image and it will do the same thing. Um, there are other reverse image search tools out there um, that you can use if you don't use Chrome or you don't like Google, um, but those are two that are, you know, I think pretty easily accessible to most people. One caveat on the reverse image search is that it's only going to work for images that are elsewhere on the image elsewhere on the internet. So if someone is using, you know, a photo that they took themselves and putting it, miscaptioning it, putting it into the wrong context, this wouldn't work there. Um, so it's not a perfect solution, but it is one of the easiest ways to check. All right, thanks, Rachel. Um, now I'm going to talk about an issue that I think will be of interest to a lot of you, um, and that's image ma manipulation in scientific research papers. 
Uh, so here's a landmark study from 2016 that found that around 800 papers out of a very large sample that they looked at um, appeared to have evidence of deliberate image manipulation, which was around 2% of the sample. Um, often this manipulation is going to take the form of duplicating parts of an image and then pasting them into other parts of the image to change uh, what the image is conveying. So to give you a little sense of what that might look like, um, sort of show you how difficult it can be to identify these. Um, on the left, it looks like some sort of figure. It's, you know, Western blot type of thing. Um, but if you look a little bit more closely and you have some time to spend on this, um, you would find that actually over half of the uh, image basically is duplicated from other parts of the image. And sometimes they've even stretched or distorted them to make them harder to spot. If you've heard about this issue before, odds are it was in association with the name Elizabeth Bick. She's not the only person who searches for these manipulated images by any means, um, but she's been the most public and the most willing to sign her name to her critiques. Um, on the one hand, her work has led to quite a few retractions and corrections. On the other, she's found that in the majority of cases, it seems to take journals years to respond to these issues when she alerts them of them. Um, if they respond at all. So she found that after five years after that 2016 study, uh, journals had only taken any action on 30 to 40 percent of those 800 papers. So the other um, 60 to 70 percent were still floating around without any um, warnings or corrections or anything. Um, AI has shown some promise in this area, and a few publishers have begun to utilize software that can flag potential issues in submitted manuscripts, but it does still require a human to check those issues, and it's definitely not universally used um, at this point by any means. Also, as we will hear next, AI can itself be used to create and disseminate misinformation. So we know that our eyes can deceive us, and now it's time to talk about how our AIs may deceive us. Um, this is a hot topic, and it has become even hotter since we originally proposed this talk. Um, next slide. So when we talk about AI-generated imagery, um, there's several different categories that this could be. So the first is images that are generated from natural language. So these would be things, um, if you've heard of Dolly or Midjourney, where a user um, can type in a prompt and then it, uh, the AI program will produce an image of that. So if I type in, you know, an ant riding a bicycle, it can give me an image of an ant riding a bicycle. And depending on the tool or what you type in, it could do this to be more of an artistic rendering, like a cartoon, make it look like a Renaissance painting or make it look like a photograph. Um, another category of AI generated imagery are those that come from existing images. So I think this was around the end of last year, um, the app Lensa suddenly became very popular on my social media. And that is a case, that is an app that would take um, photographs of actual people's faces, but then turn them into avatars. So again, making them look, um, you know, usually much more attractive, um, cartoon, especially in the case of women, overly sexualized. Um, and that became a big privacy concern and suddenly you're not hearing as much about it, but those sorts of tools still exist. Um, so then just a, not necessarily a separate category, but an important thing to know is that AI generated images can look like photographs. You might hear the term deep fake used. Um, that's a portmanteau of deep learning and fake. And this can be used to apply to images, video, and also audio. Most commonly, this is used to make it look like a real person did something they didn't. So recent examples include um, uh, videos and images that seem to show Donald Trump being arrested in the streets um, after he was indicted that were fake. Also, if you saw that image of the Pope wearing a really puffy white coat, um, that was an AI-generated image as well. Next slide. So detecting AI images is difficult and it gets more difficult every day. Um, but as of right now, creating convincing images and videos of humans is something that AI still struggle with and really good deep fakes still require some amount of human involvement. In particular, AI seems to really struggle with, with generating hands, as you can see, hopefully from that image on the right hand side, these are all examples of hands that were generated by AI software. Most of them have the wrong number of fingers. Um, 
the joints look weird or they're otherwise anatomically improbable. Um, so that's something you can always look at is hands and fingers. Also look at the edges of the photo and the background. AI is better at generating kind of like the center focus of the image, um, but struggles with the background and edges. And um, also things to look at are any accessories like glasses, jewelry, and hats, um, making sure that the earrings match on both ears, that glasses are symmetrical, et cetera. And now we're gonna look at a couple images. So both of these people do not exist. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, you can see that she has mismatched earrings, uh, which you know could be a creative choice, but unlikely. Um, but the most obvious thing in this left image is the uh, person-like figure in the left-hand corner um, appears to be some sort of distorted human face. Um, and this is, again, an example of AI being good at generating the center focus, but struggling with background and kind of auxiliary figures. The man on the right looks much more believable. There's no kind of giveaways of asymmetry or a um, warped figure lurking in the background. But a couple of things to point out. If you look at the hair on his forehead, it looks just a little odd. Like some of the hair is not connecting back up to his scalp and is instead floating in front of his forehead. And then down around his neck, below the collar of his shirt, there's sort of like a shiny plastic material there, uh, which again, seems unlikely for a shirt texture. Um, but this one is definitely a lot harder and is an example of how um, good AI generated imagery can be. Okay, so um, this hopefully doesn't, some of this might seem a little bit alarming, uh, but we're gonna talk really briefly about what we can do, some ideas that we have uh, for libraries and things that we've tried. Okay, so again, if you have a library that you work at or a community center, uh, we would suggest doing some programming around this issue. So you could host a workshop or a class, uh, maybe on health myths, identifying health misinformation or misleading visualizations. Any of these topics are really important. Uh, we, you could partner with some local experts. So you could host a talk or a panel to talk about some of these issues. Uh, you can host a misinformation escape room. Uh, if you saw Loki Loop, Loki's Loop group uh, yesterday, their presentation, we've done their misinformation escape room, and it's really great. I highly recommend that one. Um, you can tailor events to your audience. So maybe focus on social media, misinformation for teens, and then TV news for older adults. And then we also would recommend getting people involved. So can you host a contest? You know, how would your audience or your, uh, your population teach people about misinformation? They may have some really good ideas. So you can also create some materials. So maybe some handouts or brochures, or you could do a lib guide or a website. Uh, we would say that you could provide some tips with examples, but please do remember that this technology keeps changing. Uh, so you're either going to need to update your resources or you might just wanna focus on context. So telling people, how can they double check some of these things as, IA get, as AI gets better at hands and, and some of this other imagery, uh, it's gonna be really important to, for people to understand how they can check as opposed to just looking at an image uh, and just knowing whether it's AI generated or not. And then, you know, provide some recommended resources like Medline Plus. You could also think about having some displays. So relevant books that are really great, like Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble, or uh, Meredith Broussard has two books that might be really helpful for some of your patrons. And then you could include interactivity. So do you have a laptop or an iPad that's queued up with images? MIT has a really good detect fakes site that can help people practice detecting deep fakes. Um, or if you don't have the technology available, you could even just have flaps that open. And so people can you know, try to guess whether an AI image is a real person or if it's you know, generated by technology. Right, so those are those are our ideas. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for two very interesting uh, presentations. I really enjoyed both of them. So we do have a few questions, and while um, some of you are forming some other questions, you can put them in the Q and A. Um, so we have a couple questions, and then there are some comments in the chat. So uh, for our first group, uh, there's a question: If open access of health information and articles became more available, would this allow online information to become more helpful, if not by itself, but through reading recommendations? 
I mean, I think that it would be helpful for a fairly small section of society. I'm a big fan of the plain language summaries of of articles. I think those are really great. I think, though, a lot of times what people need are not some new or recent article that came out that's a one-time study that's not in the context of what they're dealing with. I think when we're trying to put information together for patients, it's fundamentally a bit different. Like we're trying to address their needs and concerns, and it's often hard for them to understand how a study does or doesn't even apply to to them. Um, And oftentimes, uh, the clinicians aren't even sure. I mean, I've sent my clinicians studies, and they sometimes just don't know what to do with them uh, themselves because it's new information that we're trying to think about and that will be vetted over time. So I think it, there are people who are more like expert patients and more highly educated who will delve into those. But I think for the larger share of people, what we really want are these, you know, larger content clearing houses and libraries that are actually created for patients and again built with that patient-centered approach to meet their needs. Iran, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I, the only my only thought is that as a clinician, I would like to see open access available because you know I might need access to it as a clinician, and it is nice to be able to go uh, to to the library or to the open access information and basically <clears throat> refer to something that is that is valid to the patients. So dispelling myths with with data that is evidence based. Uh, so as a clinician, I would like to see it happen, but I totally agree with you that for most patients, it's too much. Right. Thank you for that. Um, I have a second question. Let's see. I'm going to kind of get these in order. Uh, So um, this is for the second group. Um, As a librarian who evaluates articles to teaching health profession students, is there any way to catch it easily? And I'm assuming they might be referring to the AI generated I think, I think this one might have come in when I was talking about yeah, the yeah. research articles. So right. I, I think that might be what it's referring to. Sure. Um, so off the top of my head, no. Um, so there are these, like I mentioned, like journals are starting to use these programs. But to my knowledge, there is not yet like a consumer level accessible um, program that would not be like, you know, paid for by a journal or something. Um, I can tell you that if you look at them, like I'm on Elizabeth Elizabeth Bick's Twitter feed all the time, and I she posts these like challenges every day about identifying them, um, and you definitely get better at it. Um, but I would say I think what needs to happen is like journals need to start responding to this um, when they're being alerted of these issues. Um, one thing I will say that you can do is um, to keep an eye on Retraction Watch because they have. Um, a filter for uh, articles that are retracted due to um, image manipulation. So you can keep an eye on that and make sure that if you're using something in a publication that there hasn't been some recent um, issue with it, at least that's known. So that's that's my best advice on that front right now. Well, there was a question about sharing the titles of books you mentioned. So I'm not sure who mentioned books, but uh, that might have been Rebecca or yeah. So if you want to put those in the chat, yeah, okay. And then here's a question that might be good for any of any and all of you to address. Uh, has anyone of you experienced working with refugees who are non-English speakers? So what are some ways you have uh, helped in giving accurate health information to that group? And have you used a third party outsource to help with translating? Also, uh, last part of this is how do you gain their trust uh, with refugees, especially when they do not look like you? Well, I can say that I have worked with um, doing translating videos, especially into multiple languages. Um, I think video, by the way, is one of the best ways to get around reading issues, uh, whether it's a literacy issue, a health literacy issue, a vision issue. Um, It's also usually more engaging, and we know the more parts of the brain you light up in terms of like audio, visual, everything, the more you build those memory pathways and help with understanding. 
So videos, I have had them translated and there are often real problems. Like I feel that you always need to find somebody who's experienced in doing health translations. For example, once we said something was the shape of a football and they translated that to soccer ball, which is obviously a completely different shape. And that was when you thought that even a non-medical translator would have caught that like, well, clearly we're not trying to go for the ball. We're going for the shape. Um, so it's it's not that impossible to, to get those translated. The nice thing with video is you always have the image to go with it that's going to help improve understanding. So that can help a lot. And I'm also a big fan of animation where you don't necessarily have a talking head where you have to worry about who does this look like. But instead, if you just have different figures and a voiceover, you're kind of avoiding a lot of those inclusion, exclusion issues. Um, and especially if you can have it translated with different, different voiceovers. So that's been one of the ways that I've seen it addressed really well and in a way that gets around literacy issues across the board as well. Okay, does anybody else wanna comment about that? Or, I mean, okay. Um, yeah, so I think that wraps up the questions unless anyone else has any. Um, there was a question about the slides. Uh, I know they're available on the conference platform. I believe they're on, under the speaker bios if you scroll down and you see um, the title of the presentation, but if you have any trouble, Kelsey has dropped her email in the chat so you can uh, contact her directly. Um, we just had some good observations and comments in the chat. Um, so let's see. I actually saw one that somebody said they heard someone suggest that chat GPT be used to yeah, create right. content for patients. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's kind of mind blowing. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to say in terms of, I know there were some comments about working with um, hospitals, medical libraries that Iran talked to a little bit earlier, but I think that absolutely part of human-centered design is including the clinicians who are going to be using the content. They need to see it. They need to feel comfortable with it. They need to feel like they have input into it as well. and. Um, Otherwise, I find that they can be a, a barrier and it's it's fair. They want to know what their patients are getting and that it's appropriate and what they would actually, actually tell them. The other thing I would just like to say, because there's probably people out here who do this kind of research, is there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that we can reduce web searches and turning to Google for information, but there's not much formal research on that at all. So if that's something anyone's interested to do, um, we'd be interested to partner on that. That's great, yeah. Well, thank you. I'm gonna go over just a few details unless there's any more questions. Let's see the Q&A here. Nope, checking it one more time. Um, Kelsey's dropped in a link um, as well for the MIT site. So I thank you for that. Well, okay. Well, if there's no more questions, I really, this has been really informative and, and so interesting. And I really appreciate both of you, both of your groups um, joining us today. So let me go on here and just share some of our wrap up details. Um, so again, I want to thank uh, not only our speakers, but Jen and Carolyn, our chat monitors, and uh, Bernisa, our captioner. Really appreciate you uh, being here to help us today with this session. Uh, so if you're interested in claiming MLACE credit for this session and, and any others that you've attended, you're going to receive an email after the symposium ends with a questionnaire and some instructions on how to claim CE. We have about 35 minutes until our next session. So uh, we've asked that you please take a little bit of time to go visit one of the booths on the platform uh, for the event. Uh, you know, please step away from your computer, stretch your legs, move around, get outside if the weather's nice. It's really chilly here in Kansas City today. Uh, uh, and we do look forward to seeing you at the 4.30 Eastern session. But also before I wrap up, I wanna encourage you to join our network. Uh, membership is organizational. It's not for individuals, but it does 
offer uh, great opportunities uh, such as funding and print resources to um, member organizations. And finally, um, I do want you to um, note that if you're still interested in continue, if you're continuing this journey of uh, exploring health misinformation, NNLM is launching a new uh, health misinformation webinar series. Um, this series will feature presentations from expert, expert guest speakers like Kelsey. She'll be presenting uh, for us in uh, June. It'll be a follow-up to this presentation that she's given us today. We also have presentations from health educators, healthcare providers, and they will be exploring various aspects of health misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. And you will learn about practical and evidence-based solutions on how to identify it and to help curb its spread. These presentations will be scheduled intermittently throughout the year. And you can learn about uh, the upcoming sessions by checking out the NNLM training calendar. So if uh, Jen or Carolyn can drop that in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, so that brings us to the end today. And I thank all of you again for being here and hope to see you at the next uh, session at 4.30. Thank you so much.